In any school day, there are plenty of key moments when relationships between teachers and pupils get strained. We asked a panel of teachers to analyse three scenarios. They'll discuss what the teachers do and say what they think could be done to improve the relationship. Right, Courtney, would you like to read your homework? The Bela is sparkly, shining diamond. The Bela is a sparkly. Could you stop for me one moment, please? Emma, is that the right thing for you to be doing? No. So please don't do that again. Right, Emma, it's your turn to read out your homework. Emma, this is your second warning. I'd like you to stand up and read your homework, please. Right, the choice is yours. You can either read out your homework or go to the year six class. Right, we're going to year six. I'm very disappointed in you, Emma. I asked you to read out your homework and you were messing about. Was that too difficult for you? You should have said, next time, come and ask me for some help, okay? Okay. We had, we had a child there who didn't feel safe, didn't we? That's why she was acting out, because she was doing that thing that we all do, which is we behave in the opposite way to the way we feel in order to hide the, and mask the feelings that we've got. And so I think the teacher has a big issue there with creating that place of safety in her classroom, don't you? I think it depends on the expectations of the teacher. Yes. I mean, it was unacceptable for the child to behave in such a way. Firstly, someone was talking and they weren't respecting that. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that the teacher focused on the negative behaviour, I feel she should have rather said, oh, could we, can you look at the next child who's behaving the way they should? Someone's there presenting their work. What you should be doing is listening and giving them that respect. Yes. The child was asked to present their work as a result of poor behaviour, which, which puts the focus on a negative behaviour. Um, and the child was there, that's when the differentiation issue came up, that the child wasn't actually able to do the work. So what you've got is a double negative yes. for that child. A teacher has a huge duty, don't, don't, doesn't she, of being sensitive to the needs of her, her children, particularly if they are struggling with work. Well, that's a professional duty. It is a professional and duty. Perhaps that teacher needs to build in, if it's homework with it, Perhaps it's a time in the day, this is when I'm going to go through your homework with you. Yes. And if, even if that takes two days to get through the homework, it's much better than that, passing that feeling of failure onto that child, which is resulting in the negative behaviours. So what we're, we're saying effectively is that it isn't up to the, it's not the child's duty to tell the teacher that they don't know something, it's up to the teacher to be aware of that. It is definitely up to the teacher to be aware. I think it's really important as a class teacher you know where your children are at, at all times. And also if you're checking in a, in a very public environment where all 30 children, if it is 30 children, are listening, it's only the child that can't access it that's going to have the feeling of failure. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, mm. you will fail, therefore you will fail because she's failing at least one child and probably there's a child at the back of that class feeling very vulnerable, unsafe, and the teacher's had to remove herself as well from that classroom. The teacher was trying to be in power rather than be in control. She's removed the child from the class and you've got a teacher overpowering a child, looking down until the teacher realised she had made the mistake. Yes. And then she became very much more caring and, however, still said, you should have told me. The body language of the adult is very important in these circumstances, isn't it? That, that where I pl place myself when I'm talking to children, how I look at them, whether I give them eye contact or choose not to, can actually be very powerful. If we were going to advise her, right, how to move on from this point that she's got herself at, um, what advice would we give her, do you think? My advice would be to go back and have a circle time where you talk about setting boundaries on behaviour and what is, and maybe boundaries on what you need to do when you don't get your homework and ways in which to feed that back. Do, do you think there's, there's some mileage in saying that it would be valuable if she actually apologised? And if she went in back to the glass and said, look, I got this all wrong, I'm sorry. If she has it within herself to go back in and say, by the way, I've made a mistake here, I'm sorry, it would create the atmosphere for the child to apologise and it would take out the emotional charge 
of that situation. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're right. And I'm sure that by leading on that, you're actually creating a place of safety again, aren't you, in the classroom, that the children will then begin to feel safe again because the teachers said, I respect you. It's, it's a respect issue, isn't it? Joseph, do you want to be Zarina's buddy and be my book monitor this afternoon? Yeah, Zarina feels like having a friend in class today. Do you want to go and get the books and give everyone a book? Well done, thank you. What do we think about the way in which uh, that child was dealt with by the teacher? I think they've obviously got great strategies in place. I mean, the confidentiality box, the fact that the teacher made time to go outside and find out. I think the teacher did a really good job there. It does seem to be a, an emotionally literate school where yeah. strategies are in place, a circle of trust is built. It started with the teacher, a private note, then a private conversation, got down to the child's level, made the child smile very quickly, mm. and then put the child into an area that's obviously arranged by the school for friendship to begin. And immediately then there was a link to the classroom, arranged for a buddy for the child, and immediately gave the buddy and the child a reward, some responsibility to enable that child to feel very good about themselves in the learning environment in order to carry on with their day, in order to carry on with their learning. I would like to come back to the way the teacher announced it to the class. Yes. I would feel not very comfortable with that because the fact that the child wrote it in a confidential way, she should have just found the buddy for her. but. I feel she didn't have to say that she felt she didn't have any friends. I think there's a balance between the confidentiality and professional judgment. What, we, what we'd like to see is the child empowered to make their own friendship circles and also for other children to spot other children's social and emotional problems and have that as a culture within a school. It seemed clear that the play leaders were trained, but the, the children in the class maybe needed training as well. You have to give them the tools. You can't teach someone how to be a good friend, but you can most probably address the qualities of friendship. It would have to be part of the culture that people were trained, and it's what the school does. Then it's easy for a child to join that school and to become part of the learning environment as opposed to the coping environment if those systems aren't in place. I think one of the important things as well, isn't it, is, is that, that we should think about the type of questions that we ask children. Because if I ask you a closed question like, um, are you feeling all right? You may well say to me, yes, I'm all right, miss, because that's what, you know, I think you want to hear. Whereas if I say to you, um, I can see you seem to be rather unhappy at the moment. Uh, what can I do for you? That may allow the child to respond in a, a more open way. It's such a vital moment. What happens after you read that little slip, I have no friends. Yeah and just taking a little moment to think what is the first thing you're going to say to that child is vital for that child. We need to be very sensitive to the needs of parents with their children, don't we, if a, if a parent has an unhappy child? I think it is always important to involve the parents because it is their child and they'll be able to tell you she's had a bad night or things aren't great or she's been feeling ill. Um, what I don't want to do is to be going in and saying, why is your child so unhappy? I think there's an issue with timing. Allowing, giving the parent that information immediately might be detrimental to the child. Yeah. It might be a case of waiting a day and letting the strategies that were in place in that situation kick in, allow the child to feel happier, and then give the parent a retrospective of what's happened. Absolutely. Your child yesterday was feeling very lonely. This is what we've done as a school. In fact, what we're talking about are learning organisations. I need to take away all the, the, the problems that are surrounding me in order to be free to learn, don't I? The most important learning right now for the child that's lo lonely is how to make friends. Yes, absolutely. OK, that's it. You can sit down. Oh, that's rubbish, Year 5. Simon didn't say sit down. Miss, I did sit down. Aren't you clever? <laughs> OK, Simon says sit down and take out your books and read. What are you 
you two talking about? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, come on, you can tell me. Well, I saw you on Saturday with a man. Mrs. has got a new boyfriend. Mrs. has got a new boyfriend. No Mrs. comment, year five. Hey, what did you think? What did you feel? I think she's tried to gain control of the class to start the learning going with a game of Simon Says. Only one child followed that rule and that child then opens out into what we saw next, which was quite a heavy-duty behavioural issue, um, starting with the teacher's sarcasm and it then did, leading it? into yeah. what was, in, in effect, bullying. Uh, she allowed it with her language and that then set the scene. I feel the teacher really should have kept within the boundaries of professionalism. It's okay for the children to trust you and to have banter when it's appropriate and done in the appropriate way. It was hugely over-familiar over mm. um, and inappropriate teacher-pupil relationship going on there, wasn't there? Part of our role is as a role model, especially in a primary classroom where sometimes we're the only positive role model in a child's life. And so if that is to open yourself up to public ridicule, it's not a very good role model to be following. If it's also rewarding sarcasm and modelling sarcasm, again, you're limiting your effect as a positive role model quite severely, I think. Um, it's about self-respect. If I can't respect myself, then I'm modelling a very poor model to you if I want you to be able to respect yourselves. It's not only the teacher who's at risk now. We don't know how vulnerable some of those other children in that class were, and so they, will, they won't feel safe now, because who's going to protect them? The teacher can't even protect herself in that situation. What's going to happen next? And for the vulnerable children, that really quite worries me. Where does she need to go now, the teacher? I think it comes back to whole school behaviour policies, if that, that, that there is a certain code in which we expect her to behave. And do the children know the boundaries? Does the teacher reinforce those boundaries and does she model uh, working within the boundaries that either the school and herself has set? And, and it's, it's, it's all use of body language and how we stand and how we present ourselves and whether we look assertive enough in a classroom. And I think that uh, those are skills that we acquire. Um, they, don't, they come naturally to some people, but they don't to everybody. But we can teach people that. And if she has an assertive approach, then in fact what will happen in the end is the class will behave appropriately because... The children don't want to behave like that. They don't. There's four or five who are enjoying it yeah. immensely at the moment, but they don't want that. No. They don't come to school for that. No. So how do you think she feels now? Oh, I think she feels de-skilled and needs to seek advice and support from senior colleagues to ask what would they do in that situation. I think the answer might come back. There's a lot you should have done before. Yeah. But it's never too late with a class, especially in a primary school. It's never too late to start putting in positive behaviour management strategies with acceptable boundaries. It's never too late. And again, it goes back to control rather than power. Um, but it's about saying, you know, this is what happens in my room. This is what we do. This is how we behave. Or maybe even this is what happens in our room. In our room. Agreed this is this is This is our agreed code mm. and these are the boundaries which we set ourselves and that oversteps the boundary. Yeah, correct. Okay.